I was a failure at everything I did. For the artists in Motown, they'd all come from projects, what we call council flats. They'd all come from the projects. Stop thinking so much uh, uh, about my erotic fantasies, and I started to think about the war in Vietnam with my brother. Cancer came back. It's two small tumors. Listen along. The world of show business is unparalleled. And the distinctive sound of Motown stands out among the rest. In the 60s, if you had a record player, you had to play Motown records. Renowned for crafting glorious melodies and K-hooks. Listen, baby, ain't no mountain high, ain't no... Motown served as the launching pad for several iconic music careers, whether Michael Jackson's thrilling performances, the timeless allure of the Supremes, or the soothing tunes of Lionel Richie, all trace their roots back to Motown. Established in 1959 in Detroit and later merging with Universal, this legendary record label originated with an $800 loan from the family savings of its founder, Barry Gordy. A Detroit native and former car plant worker, Gordy applied an assembly line approach to produce high quality music. The original headquarters of Motown on West Grand Boulevard was aptly nicknamed Hitsville, USA. The label's talented artists churned out a multitude of hits, some of which continue to resonate with audiences today. Unfortunately, many of Hitsville's residents faced challenging lives marked by poverty, violence, and debilitating illnesses. It was actually horrendous. I knew about uh, some of the segregation. And I looked and saw this, this uh, double barrel shotgun, and I definitely backed up. It's a poignant irony that those who bring immense joy to the world often endure significant pain and hardship, starting with the Isley Brothers. <laughs> The brothers, undoubtedly a cherished band globally, underwent a turbulent journey as internal conflicts slowly eroded their once unbreakable unity. As disputes and legal battles among the band's brothers intensified over time, it contributed to their eventual decline. Furthermore, the mysterious circumstances surrounding some of their deaths continue to be enveloped in intrigue. I did shows for them, man. I did some of the best shows in my career. The Isley Brothers are a complex musical entity, characterized by their numerous faces and transformations throughout their illustrious career. They emerged as a pre-Motown, pre-Beatles rock and roll vocal trio, renowned for their original recordings of classics like Shout and Twist and Shout. They evolved into a Chitlin Circuit R&B band known for introducing the world to Jimmy James, later known as Jimi Hendrix, through the single Testify. Their Motown era from 1965 to 68 yielded hits like This Old Heart of Mine. Transitioning into a self-contained funk band, they made waves with chart toppers like It's Your Thing and Fight the Power. They also ventured into crossover success with soul-infused covers of rock songs such as Seals and Croft's Summer Breeze. After their last R&B hit in 1989, they continued as an oldies act. <laughs> However, their contributions in the entertainment industry are unforgettable. The Isley Brothers, a quintet of musicians relocated to upstate New York in 1976 to craft the iconic funk album Go For Your Guns. This marked a significant shift from their beginnings as a precocious gospel group over two decades earlier. The band had undergone a significant transformation with a new generation of Isley Brothers including Ernie, Marvin, and in-law Chris Jasper joining the original trio of O'Kelly, Ronald, and Rudolph. Their sound had evolved over the years, taking them from gospel roots to becoming rock and roll pioneers, Motown signees, champions of black power, acoustic folk balladeers, and in the early 70s, trailblazers in the funk genre arguably becoming one of the most prominent and popular acts in this style. 63 years ago, we had the hit record Shout. Mm. Uh, we were singing where before that. Intriguingly, despite consistently charting new music in each decade from the 50s to the 2000s, there exists a surprising dearth of comprehensive literature on the Isley Brothers. Unlike many other iconic artists and bands, they have not been the subject of tell-all books, multi-volume biographies, or autobiographies chronicling their journeys. The available literature, such as a self-published 72-page book by Rudolph's daughter, fails to capture the full depth of the group's story. I remember writing the song, Shout, in 1959 on the stage of Philadelphia, and uh, I'll never forget that. 
Their albums in the early 1970s and leading up to Go For Your Guns traversed various styles, from singer-songwriter covers to soul funk, glitter rock, and more. Go For Your Guns marked a pivotal moment in their career as it became a significant success both commercially and critically. The album's standout track, Footsteps in the Dark Parts 1 and 2, would later be sampled by Ice Cube for his hit, It Was a Good Day. Just waking up in the morning, gotta thank God. I don't know, but today see. The Isley Brothers' Go For Your Guns album represented a critical juncture in their extensive career showcasing their adaptability and the evolution of black music. Despite their enduring impact on the music industry, they have not received the widespread recognition they deserve in the pantheon of iconic artists likely due to the absence of a major crossover hit. Their ability to evolve and keep pace with the ever-changing music landscape is a testament to their longevity and influence on the world of music. Number one record for five weeks mm -hmm. and Number one album, no, 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 the album been submitting their own. But to Weissbard, the Isleys getting boxed out of the rock canon due to white bands appropriating the sounds of black performers is only part of the story. The bifurcation of R&B and rock is not primarily a story about a shattered civil rights dream, and the growth of R&B as its own category is at least as important. African Americans well before and long after the movement peaked sought culturally unifying but commercially viable music against ever-mutating barriers including white appropriation. In 1984, Isley Jasper Isley formed a breakaway faction from the Isley Brothers, comprising Chris Jasper, Ernie Isley, and Marvin Isley. Their discography includes three albums, among them Caravan of Love, showcasing the immediate success of its title track, penned and sung by Chris Jasper. Notably, the song was subsequently covered by the English recording group, The House Martins, transforming it into a global pop sensation. Are you ready for the time of your life? It's time. In 1987, Isley Jasper Isley disbanded, and in 1992, they were collectively inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The Isley Brothers received the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award in January 2014. Well, I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you, the Academy. I mean, uh, we had such a wonderful, wonderful. Following the disbandment of Isley Jasper Isley, Chris Jasper embarked on a solo journey as an artist, multi-instrumentalist, and producer. Venturing into entrepreneurship, he founded his own record label Gold City Records and delivered 14 solo albums which included four gospel releases. Meanwhile, the Isley Brothers faced a series of changes and challenges. The eldest member O'Kelly passed away in 86. Rudy and Ronald carried on as a duo, releasing a couple of albums before Rudy retired in 1989 to pursue a life in the Christian ministry. In 1991, Ronald resurrected the group with Ernie and Marvin, but Marvin left the ensemble five years later due to complications from diabetes, eventually succumbing to the illness in 2010. Ronald and Ernie persevered, continuing to perform under the moniker the Isley Brothers. Uh, Marvin had a great sense of humor. Um, he uh, was, uh, he could write lyrics real fast. However, O'Kelly's death was a potential turning point in their journey. O'Kelly Isley, a prominent rhythm and blues singer and one of the founding members of the legendary singing group, had a significant impact on the music industry. He was born on December 25, 1937, and grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. O'Kelly, often referred to as Kelly, began his singing journey in church. As a teenager, he and his three younger brothers, Rudy and Ronnie, formed the singing group the Isley Brothers. Unfortunately, they faced a tragic loss when their younger brother, Vernon, was caged at the age of 13 in a bicycle versus car accident in 1955. In 1959, O'Kelly and his remaining brothers, Rudy and Ronnie, signed with RCA Victor and transitioned from gospel music to rhythm and blues. That same year, the brothers co-wrote their first significant hit, Shout, and we all know that this song became a major success and made its way into popular culture. They appeared on television shows like American Bandstand in 59 and Shindig in 64 performing Shout. The song was recorded by various artists, including Lulu in 1964 and David Ruffin in 98, and it was featured in films like National Lampoon's Animal House. Seven decades in the business. Wow. Well, eight? Every since uh, 1959 was the first hit record, Shout. Although Shout didn't initially reach the top 40 hits on the Billboard Hot 100 singles chart, it sold millions of copies, establishing it as a financial success. The group went on to switch record labels, moving from RCA Victor to Florence Greenberg's Skepta Records, and later to Barry Gordy's Motown Records Corporation. During their musical journey, they produced more hits such as Twist and Shout in 1962 and This Old Heart of Mine in 66. And that was the time when the emerging Jimi Hendrix played guitar for the Isley Brothers in 64. In 1969, the group 
group left Motown and founded their own record label, T-Neck Records, named after T-Neck, New Jersey. Their 1969 Grammy-winning hit introduced a funk sound that became the group's anthem. Rolling Stone magazine even ranked It's Your Thing on its list of the 500 greatest songs of all time. The Isley Brothers were known for their dynamic stage performances, clapping their hands to the beat and engaging in energetic dancing which included gymnastics moves like the split. When the Isley Brothers signed with Warner Brothers, T-Neck Records ceased to exist, marking the end of an era. Unfortunately, O'Kelly Isley faced several health issues including obesity, cancer, and cardiac disease. He had a heart attack at the age of 48, which was followed a few days later by a cerebral hemorrhage leading to his passing. Kelly and Ronald uh, were looking for a guitarist to uh, play in the band. However, the band's bad luck did not stop here. It was yet followed by another sudden death, which was of Rudolph Isley. Rudolph Isley, one of the founding members of the Isley Brothers, passed away at the age of 84. The Isley Brothers confirmed the news in a statement on social media. Quote, Heaven has gained another angel. Our hearts are heavy as we announce the passing of our beloved brother Rudolph Isley, the statement said. But after some time, his brother Ronald Isley expressed his grief, saying, quote, There are no words to express my feelings and the love I have for my brother. Our family will miss him, but I know he's in a better place. Ronald is the brother who has been been involved in many conspiracies and legal battles, making people point their fingers toward him and even people think that he is potentially responsible for Rudolph's death. The speculations were further made strong when people found out that throughout the years, the Isley Brothers went through various genre shifts, from funk and disco to quiet storm and R&B. However, Rudolph remained dedicated to the group even as younger brothers Marvin and Ernie joined in the late 1960s. Everybody that I talked to tonight said you were the ones they wanted to meet. Wow, what a compliment. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. However, what people believe is that Rudolph found himself embroiled in a legal battle with his brother Ronald over the rights to the Isley Brothers' name. A family feud erupted within the Isley Brothers as Rudolph Isley accused his younger brother Ronald of making secretive moves that could potentially deprive him of substantial earnings. But court documents are saying Ron underhandedly went and got ownership of the Isley Brother trademark. One of Rudolph's fans wrote, quote, Ronald is greedy, period. Family is tight as long as no money is involved. The minute money is involved, it becomes another story. This is really a moral case, which Ronald clearly lacks. The remaining family members should split things down the middle, rather a person is active or not. Sickening. People believe that it was the curse of Motown that followed the Isley brothers and ruined them. However, it is just a one story. Motown's history is filled with such tragic destruction of the artists. Barry Gordy famously characterized the Motown sound as a blend of rats, roaches, soul, guts, and love. A fusion that material in the Snake Pit, a studio located in the basement of Motown's Detroit headquarters. In this creative crucible, a group of session musicians known as the Funk Brothers crafted numerous masterpieces. Among these musical virtuosos was James Jamerson, lauded by Gordy as a genius on the bass and an incredible improviser. Jamerson played a pivotal role in shaping many Motown classics such as You Keep Me Hanging On by The Supremes and Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. Despite his significant contributions, Jamerson's role was often overlooked. According to OZY during the 1960s, it was commonplace for record companies not to give due credit to background musicians. But Motown's neglect was particularly egregious. The Funk Brothers struggled financially, earning so little that they had to take on additional gigs and clubs just to make ends meet. Jamerson's talents were further disregarded when he was snubbed at Motown's 25th anniversary celebration and even barred from going backstage, adding insult to the injury of a challenging life. I can actually see them in my mind and, and visualize them where they were, you know, Bob and all of them, you know, back in the day. According to All Music, Jamerson bore a physical reminder of a challenging period in his life, a limp resulting from a bicycle accident that rendered him wheelchair bound for a year, leaving him self conscious throughout his lifetime. While developing his musical skills after high school, he began to grapple with alcoholism, a struggle that ultimately consumed him. Ravaged by addiction and emotional issues, Jamerson experienced multiple stays at hospitals and mental institutions in the latter part of his life. In a tragic turn of events, his Fender Precision Bass, an instrument integral to his musical legacy, was stolen shortly before Jamerson's untimely death at the age of 42 due to pneumonia. This final blow added to the series of hardships that marked Jamerson's tumultuous life. Motown stars often grappled with personal tragedies both on and off stage, and Mary Wells, the artist who played a pivotal role in Motown 
Motown's early success was no exception. According to the history of rock, Wells, born in Detroit in 43, faced a challenging childhood marked by an absent father and a mother working as a domestic to support her three children. At the age of three, Wells experienced temporary paralysis due to spinal meningitis, requiring her to learn to walk again. Her journey into music began in church as a young girl, and by the age of 10, she was singing in contests and clubs. No, you took my At 16, Wells crossed paths with an assistant to Barry Gordy Jr. of Motown Records, leading to her singing with the label. Her debut recording, Bye Bye Baby, marked the beginning of her collaboration with Smokey Robinson, resulting in a series of hits. I really kind of owe you something because after I started to write and produce records for you, my career just took off. And, uh... The pinnacle of her success came in 1964 with My Guy, which became Motown's first number one pop hit, characterized by Billboard as a result of her smooth, knowing, but coy delivery. It's not that you backed by Robinson's understated popish arrangement. However, amid her rising career, Wells faced significant personal challenges. According to People, she married backup singer Herman Griffin at the age of 17, divorcing him two years later after he pressured her into undergoing two abortions due to her burgeoning career. Mary Wells faced a tumultuous period in her life, struggling with drug addiction starting around 1978. In her own words, quoted in Mary Wells' The Tumultuous Life of Motown's First Superstar, she explained, quote, I use drugs for relief, like so many other people do but never talk about it. Her drug use included heroin, cocaine, and methadone for most of her life, with a hiatus only during her pregnancy with her daughter Sugar. Despite her challenges, Wells successfully completed a drug rehab program in 1990. That same year, according to People, Wells received the devastating news that she had laryngeal cancer, which later spread to her lungs, silencing her famed voice. Lacking health insurance, Wells faced considerable financial strain. Singer Martha Vandella, who had toured with her in 1989, revealed to People that Wells eventually, quote, had no voice at all, and could only whisper the lyrics. Cancer came back. It's two small tumors. It's in the lungs. It's a small tumor on the vocal cord. To aid her, Bruce Springsteen contributed $10,000 and radio stations helped raise over $150,000 from colleagues and fans. Wells underwent a painful course of treatment including radiation therapy and tracheotomy, making even talking a painful endeavor. I hope they didn't get this as disturbed as I did about it, but it's not the truth. On July 26, 1992, Mary Wells passed away. According to her daughter Stacy, Wells bore her suffering stoically, never complaining but shedding tears because she could no longer engage in what she loved most, singing. Talking about more women of the records, Tammy Terrell had the most tragic ending of her career. Tammy, despite her undeniable talent, remained somewhat overshadowed when compared to other Motown luminaries like Diana Ross and Gladys Knight. This can be attributed in large part to her untimely demise at the age of 24 in 1970. One can't help but wonder about the potential trajectory of her career had she experienced better fortune in her personal life and health. Despite her relative obscurity, Tammy's undeniable gifts leave us to speculate on the remarkable achievements she might have accomplished. If you need me, call me, no matter where you are, no matter how Tammy Terrell, an American singer, achieved prominence as one of the standout stars for Motown Records in the 60s, particularly through her acclaimed duets with Marvin Gaye. Launching her career as a teenager, Tammy initially recorded for Skepter Wand Records, and later spent two years as a key member of James Brown's live show. After a brief stint with Checker Records, she inked a deal with Motown in 65. In collaboration with Marvin Gaye, Tammy Terrell delivered several chart-topping hits including classics like Ain't No Mountain High Enough, Ain't Nothing Like The Real Thing, and You're All I Need To Get By. Her contributions to Motown's legacy and her remarkable duets with Gaye solidified her enduring impact on the music industry. Nothing you could buy could make me tell a to my guy. In an episode of music documentary series Unsung, it was revealed that Terrell suffered from health, mental, and physical trauma after being arred when she was a teenager on her way home from school by three boys. In 1962, a 17-year-old Terrell became involved in an abusive relationship with singer James Brown, who was 12 years older than her. One night in 1963, Terrell left Brown after he assaulted her for not watching his entire performance. Bobby Bennett, a former member of the Famous Flames, witnessed the incident, saying, quote, He beat Tammy terribly.
terrible. She was bleeding, shedding blood. Tammy left him because she didn't want her butt whipped. In 1966, Terrell then started a romance with The Temptations lead singer David Ruffin. That year, Terrell accepted Ruffin's marriage proposal. After Terrell announced their engagement on stage, she discovered that he was already married. Ruffin had a wife, three children, and another girlfriend in Detroit. Don't embarrass me, I ain't in front of all the people. This and Ruffin's drug addiction led to several violent arguments. In 1967, Terrell ended their relationship after Ruffin hit her in the head with his motorcycle helmet. As Tammy Terrell rose to stardom, she grappled with persistent migraines and headaches that had plagued her since childhood. On October 14, 1967, during a performance of Your Precious Love alongside Marvin Gaye at Hampton Sydney College in Virginia, she collapsed into Gaye's arms on stage. Medical examinations revealed a tumor on the right side of Terrell's brain leading to brain surgery in early 68. Despite the challenges, she demonstrated resilience by continuing to record and perform after her initial recovery. However, the tumor persisted, necessitating additional surgeries. By 1969, doctors advised Terrell to retire from live performances due to her deteriorating health, rendering her too ill to produce new music. There were claims that Valerie Simpson stepped in for Terrell during the recording of her third album with Gay, titled Easy. Marvin Gaye alleged that this move was orchestrated by Barry Gordy as a financial maneuver. In contrast, Simpson maintained that Terrell was brought into the studio when she was strong enough to record over Simpson's guide vocals. In a poignant moment in 1969, Tammy Terrell made her final public appearance at the Apollo Theater during one of Marvin Gaye's performances. Spotting Terrell in the audience, Gaye rushed to her side, and the duo delivered a heartfelt rendition of You're All I Need to Get By, earning a standing ovation. This touching moment marked the end of an era for Tammy, leaving an indelible imprint on the hearts of those who witnessed their musical collaboration. The ravages of brain cancer left Tammy Terrell confined to a wheelchair by early 1970, grappling with severe complications. At this stage, she endured blindness, hair loss, and weighed a mere 93 pounds. After undergoing her eighth and final operation on January 21st, 1970, Terrell slipped into a coma. Sadly, she passed away on March 16th, just a month shy of her 25th birthday. Her funeral took place at the Jane's Methodist Church in Philadelphia. During the poignant ceremony, Marvin Gaye delivered a heartfelt eulogy, accompanied by the emotional strains of You're All I Need to Get By. Despite the pain of loss, Gay's tribute added a poignant touch to the farewell. In a noteworthy development, Tammy Terrell's mother, reportedly upset, prohibited anyone from Motown, with the exception of Gay, from attending the funeral. Gay, whom she regarded as Terrell's closest friend, was granted an exception by Terrell's fiancé, Dr. Ernest Ernie Garrett. Marvin Gay was known to have never fully gotten over Terrell's death, according to several biographers. It has been stated that Terrell's death saw Gay go into a depression and suffer from drug abuse. Marvin Gaye, a brilliant singer and songwriter, wove melodies that resonated with the deepest emotions of the human experience, from the sensual allure of Let's Get It On to the poignant commentary on war and what's going on, and the advocacy for environmentalism in Mercy Mercy Me. Gaye's musical repertoire touched hearts in profound ways, yet the harmonious beauty he created existed in stark contrast to the tumultuous and painful chapters of Gaye's life. Stop thinking so much uh, uh, about my erotic fantasies, and I started to Think about the war in Vietnam and my brother. Born into a troubled family, Gay faced a challenging upbringing with Marvin Gaye Sr., a preacher whose inclinations towards drinking, cross-dressing, and violence created a tumultuous environment at the time. The abuse inflicted upon young Marvin was so severe that as he later recounted, quote, by the time I was 12, there was not an inch of my body that hadn't been bruised and beaten. Despite achieving soaring fame, Gay's life was marked by profound sorrow. The death of his singing partner, Tammy Terrell, in 1970 due to a brain tumor left him deeply depressed and contemplating leaving the music industry. The challenges continued with multiple divorces, struggles with drug addiction, and a descent into paranoia complete with measures like food and water testing and armed bodyguards. In a tragic turn of events in 1983, Marvin Gaye returned home to live with his parents. On the eve of his 45th birthday, a confrontation with his father resulted in a fatal shooting. Reportedly, Gay's last words were, quote, I got what I wanted. I couldn't do it myself, so I made him do it. This heartbreaking conclusion added a somber layer to the legacy of a musical genius whose life was marred by personal demons and internal struggles. The Jackson 5, comprising brothers, catapulted a young Michael Jackson into stardom, concealing a tumultuous upbringing marred by their abusive father, Joe Jackson. Joe, who passed away in 2018, subjected them to harsh discipline often resorting to beatings with a belt buckle or the cord of an electric kettle. I told you what would happen if... 
Among his favored forms of punishment was forcing them to laboriously carry cinder blocks across their garden for hours. Prior to achieving fame, the siblings were deprived of the normalcy of playing with other children, compelled instead to dedicate five hours daily to rehearsals after school. In instances where the Jackson 5 members erred in their dance steps, Joe Jackson resorted to physical punishment. Michael in particular was reportedly so fearful of his father that the mere presence of Joe would induce vomiting and fainting. As Michael Jackson matured, he faced his own set of challenges. Accusations of S abuse against children surfaced multiple times, which he consistently denied during his lifetime. Even after his death in 2009, his estate vehemently continued to refute these allegations. These heart-wrenching tales from Motown's history only scratched the surface, revealing just a glimpse of the struggles faced by numerous lesser-known artists. Many of these talented individuals remained unrecognized throughout their careers, and their stories often ended in tragedy. Anyway, that's it for today. See you in the next video. Until then, goodbye.